Uh, afternoon, beginning of the afternoon, uh, we have from the University of Huddersfield, Andrew Walsh, whose place is well and truly at the forefront of development and information and delivery. Uh, winner of many awards um, for his work and publishing widely and with a computer game under his belt to boot, I he's the perfect person to balance the day. So, Andrew. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me here today. Uh, so, I'll just start this up. I'll probably be quite naughty not standing in front of the microphone. I don't know if it's in. So, uh, yeah. If you can't hear me at the back, shout at me and I'll, I'll speak louder. Uh, all morning, we've had about information skills at UEL. Hopefully you're all enthused by it and want to go and reuse it or repurpose it because you said it's Creative Commons isn't it? so it can be repurposed uh, I suppose my job now though is to talk more widely about innovations in information literacy uh, I'll try and talk a bit about a little bit about why you might want to innovate and why it might be a good thing and I'll try and give you lots of examples of the sorts of things that we've done at Huddersfield University and other people might have done to show you that you can innovate in all sorts of different ways. There's quite a few mentions of cost in the morning as well. Was it £10,000? So it comes in £10,000. So I think almost everybody here is from a university, from HE, and that's going to be the angle and we talk anyway. Uh, at the minute, there's the HEA have teaching innovation grants available, which are, I think, about seven or eight grand at a time. So there is money out there, you know, it's obviously cheaper to reuse somebody else's, it doesn't cost as much, and there's pots of money available, so don't be necessarily too scared about the money. All right. I should probably say a little about me, but only a tiny little bit. Uh, probably the main reason they asked me to talk is because one of my things of awards was I got the Innovation Award from UCNR a couple of years ago that UEL's got now for, for the information skills thing. I've written various bits and pieces and talked about loads of rubbish. Uh, but probably the most important thing that I want to push out here at the minute is the National Teaching Fellowship I got last year. Because hopefully there's lots of innovating librarians here that care about information skills, care about information literacy and the difference that can make to our students. If you feel you're an innovating librarian that cares about these things, it's really worth going for this National Teaching Fellowship. It's run by the Higher Education Academy, and I think there's only four librarians have got it over the, over the years. So we need more of us. You know, there's lots of ace librarians. Please go for it, because I know there's loads more librarians that can get it. So that's a tiny bit about me. I'll, I'll try and tell you a little bit about why I think we should innovate. Uh, I would say this because I like innovating, but, but these are some of my reasons for doing it. Probably the most important thing is, to be fair, most students think we're boring, don't they? You know, if you, the look on their faces when they got told to go to a library session or a library induction. Uh, yeah, none of them want to come to the library to study either, really, do they? They do it because they have to. So, if they think we're boring, we really do need to have to prove them wrong. We really have to innovate. If we're showing them the traditional librarian stereotype and approaching things in a very traditional way, you're only going to reinforce this boring image. If we want people to use our resources, <laughs> want people to make the most out of the services we offer, uh, we need to start innovating and we need to do as much of that as possible to make the library and librarians seem a lot more exciting to these students. Next thing is that sort of staff and students are changing the way they deal with information, the way they handle information. It's changing all the time. Uh, there's not so many here, but typical conference now, so most people sat there making notes on, on a netbook or, a, uh, or an iPad or whatever. So the way people, students are interacting with our <coughs> services, interacting with the information that's out there is changing. We ought to at least change with them 
and preferably one, be one step ahead of them. So only then can we sort of make sure that the services match their needs. And the information resources they use are changing as well. Twitter's one of my big sources of information. Uh, and the, what was that? that was the Stephen Lawrence thing. Lots of people got their news about the, the Stephen Lawrence case from Twitter. Not a traditional <coughs> newspaper, not anything we might provide for them. The sort of sources they're going to are changing all the time and there's a lot more social searching for information. So we ought to be thinking about that and not be thinking in terms of traditional resources and how to deliver them, but about what our students use and innovating around there. I think this is my last one on how to innovate, or last but one. Uh, that we really do make a difference to students. These are, these are a few graphs from a bit of research we did at the University of Huddersfield that linked library usage with final degree awards for undergraduates. <coughs> so we got all the data we hold and we said, well, on average, how many books does a student that gets a third take out uh, compared with how many books someone that gets a first takes out? And there's about two and a half times the number of books uh, difference between a first and a third. And similar for electronic resources, it's about three times the number of electronic resources accessed on average between a first and a third. So we're really making a difference to students if they see we're relevant and if they're interacting with our resources. So we need to really prove that relevance to them. And that's reinforced by the fact that we found no link at all between usage of the physical library building and final <coughs> degree. So they might come into our library because they have to or because they want to go on Facebook uh, on our computers. But unless we can really prove to them that the resources we've got, the books and the electronic resources, are really important and they really make a difference to them, uh, they won't get that advantage. To be honest, probably this last reason is my main reason as well, because I get bored easily. Uh, and doing the same thing year after year, it's not tremendously exciting, is it? To innovate is scary, to do different things is scary. But it's also really exciting and it's really fun. Uh, and to do some of the things we can do now for very little money or for no money at all, that can seem what would have been like magic a few years ago, it's fantastic. And it keeps your work fresh and it keeps you interested in, uh, in my case, carrying on being a librarian for the next 25 years, probably, if they let me retire at 65. <laughs> which is a big if these days. So it's really important for me to innovate, to keep my job fun, because otherwise I'm not going to last the next 25 years. So th that's a few reasons for innovating. But I thought I'd ask before I went any further whether anybody here felt like they were innovators or not. Uh, and I'm going to use a bit of software here called Poll Everywhere. Uh, if any of you have got a phone, or if you're on Twitter, do you like to have a go at answering this question? Uh, if you've got a phone and you're texting, it'll be your normal network rate. So if you're on a contract, it's likely to be free. If you're not, it'll be 10 or 12 pence. This is a little bit of software I use a lot. And if you text to the phone number at the front, it's, a, it's an international thing, so it always presents it as plus four four when I import it, but it is a UK number. Uh, and one of those numbers to say whether you do or don't feel like an innovator, or whether you've had too much of that uh, nice hot lunch and are falling asleep. I'll just give you a minute for see if a few people can answer. This is the free online equivalent of uh, how we're going to do feedback yes. later on. That's good, no one's just woken up yet. Oh, 
That's probably one of you. Was that you? Yeah, I, I totally understood this man. <laughs> <laughs> I would use one of these phones. <laughs> No, no, you can't do it twice because like, it knows you've already voted, so stop <laughs> cheating. <laughs> okay, that, that's probably long enough for that one, but that, that's just one quick illustration. Beyond stopping you falling asleep because you don't, you can just sit back and listen. Uh, how you can use mobile technology or freely available technology because for up to 30 people, this is free, so if you imagine your average uh, computer lab that you might do classes in, you can use this for free for that sort of quantity of people. And I'm really glad that about four fifths of you feel you're innovators, so it's, it's a good sign for the day, I think. I'll carry on from that. That's probably also a mild example as well as sort of one of the areas I'm going to talk about uh, where I think we need to do more innovation which is active learning and that's instead of this sort of didactic style of someone like me sat at the front and droning on for three quarters of an hour and you're dropping off actually getting people involved in their own learning so getting discussions going, games, activities so people are directly involved in what they learn. When you think about most of the things we learn, when you think about what you called your product here, information skills, most of what we in part is skill. You know, people are having to learn those skills and the only way to learn skills are by uh, carrying them out, by doing the activities and by repeating those activities. Skills you learn by doing. So it's really off standing in front and talk to somebody for the whole of a session because they're not doing anything, so they're not going to learn any of those skills. You might give them enough information to go away and try and learn them afterwards, but they won't have learned them in your class. Uh, this isn't strictly innovation for most, uh, for most teachers, but most of us aren't teachers. I mean, most of us haven't got teaching qualifications here, I bet. Uh, so, for librarians that are pushed into teaching, I'd really push Active learning has been a really quick and easy way to innovate within, uh, within your imparting of information skills to your students. I wrote a book on this, by the way. I think someone asked me before and if I could bring along a copy. I've got a copy there for them to look at afterwards. Next phase, mobile technologies, such as voting with your phones there. There's all sorts of things you can use mobiles for that would have been completely unthinkable five years ago. Uh, now, in my experience, is you can't get the students away from the phones. I don't know if that's typical. You'll probably find 98, 99% of your students have mobile phones. 100% uh, for the younger ones. Maybe just the odd mature student doesn't have a phone and refuses to get one. Uh, so they become a practical device to use for students learning because they practically all have them and increasingly they're smartphones as well so it's not just doing things like sending text messages you can do lots of uh, quite funky things so you can take videos in class with a typical phone these days most phones are camera phones uh, most phones are capable of taking video as well as pictures uh, whether or not they're a high-end smartphone or not. The phones also have embedded in them the ability to talk to other devices so you can video something on a phone and really quickly and easily put it into YouTube. Uh, you've got the, the heads, heads in YouTube here as well so if you put the videos you produce into YouTube equally, equally if they've got a smartphone they can consume that content through YouTube, so you're not having to worry about different formatting uh, and different ways of presenting a video. Things like YouTube will do it all for you. You can watch from pretty much any smartphone. All sorts of bits and pieces. You can do like QR codes and augmented reality and all sorts of bits and pieces. But <coughs> the key message here is just that 
practically all your students will have phones. Increasingly over the next few years there will be smartphones. So there's all sorts of things you can do. There's no point in me running through long lists of them because they'll be different next year and the year after compared to now. But that's, this is a really nice area to innovate around because you don't need to buy the kit. The students have the kit themselves so it's not going to cost you anything. Most of the services you'll present your, your material on will be free. Things like YouTube don't cost you anything. So it's low cost, fairly low effort, it's time, a bit of time. Uh, and the students love it because they are so close to their mobile phones, it's unbelievable. I really... I might skip this one this time. The, uh, I really encourage people to experiment with mobile technology to sort of teach information skills and to use in your classes. But I also think there's a more important point that sit along mobile devices. So mobile phones and tablets and netbooks and Kindles and all these sorts of things. Which is that it probably change what, changes what it means to be information literate. So as well as using them as tools, I think you really need to start thinking about how students use these sorts of things, these sorts of devices, which is ever changing at the minute. It's, it's sort of starting to evolve and it's not settled down in any way. And think about what you're delivering as library services and, and what, what you're trying to teach them as information skills to make it relevant with how they are dealing, how they are dealing with information nowadays. So it's a bit more serious, but I've, I've got sort of four quick points where I think there's, there's a fairly big difference between what it makes, means to be information literate uh, when you've got a smartphone or a tablet that's always on you, compared with when most of your research might be done behind a desktop PC or in the physical library. This is all from uh, the existing literature, but I think I have a little summary of some stuff I've done as well at the end. The first really big area that I think is different in mobile information literacy, and particularly in sort of searching for information in the first place, is where it happens, because it's not in a controlled <coughs> environment anymore. So th this is one quote from an interviewee. They don't think they have to be in a particular place to search for information or to use it or to organise it. It's just where they are. So it happens anywhere and everywhere. Mobile search, mobile use of information. That heavily influences the next one that's different, which is what's what sort of information people look for uh, thinking in a mobile context. In a mobile context they, they tend to look for different things than if they're in a fixed position such as in a library. It tends to be really heavily contextual. So if a student <coughs> sat in a lecture using the phone, if, they, if they're doing something serious, if they're looking up information to do with the, with the uh, the course that's been delivered at the time, it will be something like the reference that the lecturer's just mentioned. It will be really heavily influenced by that context. Most of the time it's things like bus timetable or is such and such a place open. Uh, so it, it's really heavily contextual now in a way that it probably wasn't before the searching for and use of information. How the search for information tends to be different in a mobile context as well. Uh, if they're sat in a computer in the library there first port of call will probably be Google or just using the the, uh, the bar at the top of the browser these days which probably defaults to Google or Bing uh, it's different in a mobile context they'll have decided beforehand what their preferred information supplier is so instead of going to Google they're more likely to go to a particular app so when I leave here today and try and work out where my train is, I won't Google it, I'll open Trainline app on my phone to let me know when it's coming and sort of what, uh, whether it's delayed or not. 
there isn't necessarily a lot of thought goes into that in advance so they decide who their trusted supplier is for information for various different things often on things like convenience or what it looks like and we really should be helping out there because if they're doing that evaluating of information that we really want them to do it's a really nice opportunity for us to get in there and say well this is how you evaluate whether this app that you're going to be using all the time gives you good quality information and then you don't have to worry about it at the end point and last of all is the, uh, the, the time spent I don't know why but I really like this quote which was from uh, an IT person his house is full of kit he has a smartphone he has a laptop that's at the end of his, uh, his sofa so when he's sat in front of the telly it's just within arm reach possibly just outside it and a fixed PC upstairs probably a couple of them uh, but he won't reach over and pick up his laptop now if he wants to search for anything at home because that's far too much effort and takes far too much time he gets out his smartphone so you, you're sort of pushing things towards short and shorter periods of time people don't seem to have the patience anymore to, to spend time searching for information and possibly that's more and more because of the mobile route they want to jump on and do a quick and dirty search because that's good enough and that influences everything else and not necessarily for dirty things but snigger <laughs> So I think there's sort of, from the literature, there's four big things, four big areas where sort of mobile and sort of fixed searching for and evaluating and using information tends to vary now. My slides will be off, so I wouldn't make anything off there. And, and uh, I've been doing some research into this as well. I've been saying, well, if these are the four areas, I'll dig around a bit. And I've been doing, uh, doing interviews where which is where those quotes came from on those few slides there and, and I've found similar things but I'll just throw a couple extra into there as well which is that most of the people I interviewed and talked about how they deal with information these days uh, bearing in mind these were confident smartphone users or tablet users or whatever they were really confident in this environment they said they don't remember stuff anymore which is a real big change they wouldn't make an effort to remember uh, where this place is when they're coming here today which I, I was just saying I, I didn't have a map and plan it out beforehand my phone told me where to go uh, people would go out for something to eat and instead of remembering where the, the restaurants that are good and what time they open they'll bring up an app that says what's open around them and what type of restaurants they don't make that effort to retain the information in their own head what one of them claimed was that uh, because they could find everything out easily from their mobile device they were then free to do more evaluative stuff on it so instead of remembering that such and such a place is open at seven o'clock they can then uh, move from that and think well these three places are open at seven o'clock which is the best place which has got the best reviews you know, how can I think more about this information? I'm not sure I was quite convinced in his argument it was more evaluative, but, but that was what one of the people said. Another really important thing that came up here as well, which is that the mobile world, the Wi-Fi and 3G <coughs> connectivity, meant that people use that as a bridge between lots of different devices. So they had different preferred devices for different things. So you know, I might sit here and make notes on this now uh, but I'll then send it to Dropbox and I might look at that on my phone on the way home or on my laptop and edit my notes and I'll print it off from a desktop PC so I'm using Wi-Fi and 3G as though all these things are the same so I'll just pick up, up whichever one's easiest in the context I am and relying on that constant connectivity to move things between devices it's sort of constant bridging between one thing and another so I wasn't worried about 
having my USB stick for this today because I did as backup but it's out there in the cloud somewhere uh, and equally I could pick it up from any of my devices because it's constantly out there and well in my case 3G is connecting them all so I can instantly get on any device I want to access it So I think there's big questions we need to ask about the sort of information skills we deliver and the sort of services we deliver when people are treating information in different ways. Uh, so as well as innovating with these sort of things as tools, we need to think about how people are going to use information differently in future and think about what sort of skills we need to give them that are different than in the past. So we might need to give them the skills to evaluate what apps going to give them the best results, evaluate, uh, think more about, uh, I use Dropbox to move stuff between devices, whether that's a secure medium, uh, so what should I be putting in there and what shouldn't I be putting in there, uh, what, so relevant to lots of people now, what should you put on Facebook and what shouldn't you, so it's social media literacy, if you like, all these extra things come into or I'd say would come under information literacy and information skills. So it's a different set of skills than we might have aimed at in the past. Stu students don't care about looking through indexes because they're only ever interested in one page of results anyway. Mm -hmm. So spending lots of time showing them, abstracting and indexing databases and how to get the best out of them, they probably don't care and won't use that information again however much we want them to do. So should we be thinking about different skills to deliver to them instead? My last one, my last sort of area, the one I'm going to spend a bit of time on, is sort of gamification and gaming. This is a current project we've got on at the moment called Lemon Tree, which is turning, using the library, into a bit of a game, so it's using game type ideas to encourage library use. This has cost us money and it's come from uh, a teaching and learning grant from the university. We have our annual round of grants and, uh, and we won money to do this last year. So we partnered with an external company and that's the reason it looks pretty because we have external designers that were very keen that have uh, had time and money spent on it uh, to make it look, look like it does. But I'll talk you through Lemon Tree a bit and the sort of ideas and then I'll talk perhaps a little bit more widely about games and I'll show you Lemon Tree. It sort of come, the, the whole reason we were doing it came back from that graph I showed you early on which says that people that came in the library didn't necessarily get any benefits from it. But if they used more books, accessed more electronic resources, uh, they tended to get higher classes of degree. So it was what, one of our efforts to turn social users of the library, people that might just use our computers, into active users of our resources rather than just the physical building, and see if we could end up uh, helping people get better degrees at the end of it because of it. So, oh, so when I show you lemon tree, it all looks very pretty and light, and it is fun, but there's really serious reasons behind doing it as well. Uh, partly because we were aiming at these people that were probably coming into the, user, the library and using our facilities in terms of the computers and the desks, and trying to turn them into using our information. Uh, there's a high social aspect to it. So we're trying to get, grab those people that are socialising in our space, get them to use our resources and share that with their friends. So there's a lot of social learning happening here. And what happens is they'd register with Lemon Tree and then in the background we'd automatically keep track of whether they're borrowing books or accessing electronic resources or returning books or leaving comments on things, all sorts of, sort of fairly everyday library activities that are quite easy for us to collect data on. 
and we turn those into badges and points. Uh, as I say, there is a strong social aspect to it. So as well as getting extra points for sort of doing things at the same time as a friend, so perhaps taking out a book within a couple of minutes of, of somebody that they've friended on Lemon Tree, so we're encouraging people to do things together. It also pushes out to Facebook because our students, uh, who knows what percentage are on Facebook, but it'd be well into the 90s, you know. And that's just the ones that are on it all the time, the live being that mind everybody else. So we talk to Facebook, so it's not just the people that are choosing to interact with Lemon Tree get some of the benefits. Their friends on Facebook can see what's happening as well, and hopefully they get drawn in. Lots of points and badges, but we didn't want it to be... <coughs> some people have described these sort of things as badgification. We didn't want it to be purely points and badges. We wanted a little element of progression, so people could see they're getting somewhere. So as part of that, they start off with a little seedling, a little lemon tree seedling, that slowly grows over the period of <coughs> two or three years into a fully grown lemon tree. Or, or that's what we estimated. We might have to tweak the points if it's too quick. If they stop using it, if they neglect it a bit, they might find they get books on their lemon tree. So it's to encourage them to keep going <clears throat> and to always try to get to the next level. So it's not just playing it for the first, uh, first couple of weeks and then forgetting about it. It does sort of slowly lead on. And that's just a screenshot there, of sort of people leaving comments and, and sharing things amongst each other. I'll try and show you what Lemon Tree looks like. I'll show you my, my page on Lemon Tree. So rather than screenshot showing the ideal, I'll show you what should hopefully happen. So I registered in Lemon Tree the week before it was launched. I launched in the beta, so I got a head start. So I'm towards the top of the leaderboards. Because uh, we only launched it in November, so it's still fairly, fairly early days. And this is my page. It's got my picture on there from Facebook, because it does talk to Facebook all the time. Uh, all the big key achievements are pushed out to Facebook, so it's not overwhelmed with every book you borrow, but all the key ones are. <coughs> and we should be able to see from here live activity from my feed. So, just refreshed it. Just before we started, I accessed Summon, which is how we got into Electronic Resources, <coughs> and it automatically picked up that I accessed the journal article, accessed an Electronic Resource. Uh, what else have I done? So imagine in my account there's lots of visited the library because I go in there well, every day when I have to. You see what books I've returned, what books I've borrowed, if I've left comments on books, it all appears here. So I left a review there. <laughs> Plus Bob's my daughter, it's seriously silly rhymes. And if, uh, if anybody else had bothered that, that will also show up on that page. So things like key textbooks, you're then getting social learning built into there. So people are saying, have you seen such and such a chapter? That was really useful for this assignment. And people are picking that up from their friends rather than some boring old farts out in the library saying this is the one you should have. Uh, it's uh, peer learning. If you look at everyone, that, that's there, the leaderboards. So we split that up by, by school which, uh, or faculty so they can see what their friends are doing. If we get enough volume, we'll then split it down again to departments if we need to. So it's not an overwhelming amount in, in each, uh, each set of leaderboards. So, I don't know, music, humanities and media. So the music, humanities and media students can see their friends, who's got the most points, the most visits, the most achievements. <coughs> and hopefully we get a bit of competition there, so you get the element of wanting to beat each other, uh, to spur people on to 
hopefully borrow more books but then read them afterwards you can't force them to do the reading but if you're part way there if they bothered them <coughs> so. you can make friends in lemon tree you can see what your friends are doing uh, and right at the bottom of the page which I'll, I'll show up here as well as the long term story of the lemon tree growing <coughs> we have a short term incentive as well which is your library card here so if you never come into the library if you never access an electronic resource never take a book out that would be freezing cold if you're using stuff all the time it would be scorching hot or and it sort of slowly goes in between I think seven or eight steps in between and these at the bottom are the key achievements that will, be, will have been pushed out to Facebook so they're the ones that people that aren't in lemon tree will have seen of done so they'll have seen that these happen whether or not they've chosen to register with Lemon Tree in the first place. So that's sort of what Tremon Lemon Tree looks like and how it works. Uh, try and finish <laughs> off for the next few minutes. Uh, we wanted it to be fun, we want it to be pretty, we don't want it to look like a lively thing, so we're not promoting it by putting up a poster in the library. Uh, we're trying to promote it in a bit more fun way. I mean, part of the promotion is built in. It pushes stuff out to Facebook, which is where the students spend all their time. So that's part of the promotion. Students are, by default, promoting it to their friends. But the other side of it is uh, we're doing a lot, but we're just starting now, of finding uh, objects in different environments. So we have cards. These are sort of business cards, <coughs> typesized, with codes on, with uh, where you'd get extra points for lemon tree. So scattering them in various places around the university, putting them in books that have been reserved. So books that we think have a high turnover. So students will just find them, sat there, find these quite nice looking cards. Uh, uh, as a way of sort of people stumbling over it and discovering it and it not looking too serious and too official. Uh, the phase afterwards will be stickers, so doing the same sort of ideas with stickers. If we don't get enough people through those two routes, or as many people as we want, uh, we've been threatening doing games, doing some various lemon related games around the university. So almost flash mob style, people not knowing what it's about, but something starts happening. And we've started off fairly basic with the... My kitchen tiles are filthy there. Uh, we, we started off fairly basic with the sort of achievements we've got. Because uh, they're the ones that we really wanted to know students were doing and really wanted to encourage a lot. Future developments will be things like integrating it into our reading list software. So you'd get points for clicking on all the items in the reading list software. So that goes either straight out to the electronic resources or the library catalogue. So it shows they're interacting with the information. Uh, and we, we have some degree of, uh, of seeing what sort of books people get out. You get different rewards for taking humanities books out to health books. So we can, we can tell what they're doing and give different badges. We can't do that with electronic resources yet. So one of the next phases is to try and do that with electronic resources. So they might get sort of different types of uh, rewards for a broad range of electronic resources. And I'll be remiss if I didn't mention with who were the ones that actually did the game for us. <coughs> also part of the reason we could afford it, part of the reason the money from the university covered it all, is because they still own the intellectual property for lemon tree. So we can't make it available to other people, but they're really keen on selling it to other people and adapting it for their use. So it's worth knowing that these people are out there. And they really do love libraries. The, uh, they're ex-University of Huddersfield students, and one of them's an ex-lecturer. And uh, so the, the three of them that form the company all credit the libraries sort of big style with them getting through their degrees. So, so they really do love libraries. 
I was going to ask one last question, but I'll skip over that so we're not overrunning. And I'll just say, hopefully I've, I've given you a few ideas of different areas we might be thinking about innovating. And lots of them we've done at Huddersfield, so we proved that you can do them with uh, sometimes with money, sometimes with free. My slides and other stuff from this talk are on our institu institutional repository there. The draft slides are up there at the minute. There'll be more stuff on there on Monday once, uh, once I get back from work. And there's various other stuff on there as well. All right, thank you all for listening and staying awake after lunch. <laughs>